Good morning and happy Friday. I am back here in San Francisco and ready to rock and roll. So we'll see who we have joined live today because I know we're switching times a little bit. Uh, while I was in Vietnam, it was a little harder to do this time uh, because it was in the middle of the night over there. So now we are back to uh, Pacific Standard Time and back in San Francisco. And so uh, it might be a little bit weird for people to get on live at 10.30 in the morning. But regardless, we've got a lot of questions to go through. And we're going to do a fun new little segment this morning, which is called Food Hacks. <laughs> so we're going to get into some food hacks here. So what I mean by that is basically I'm, I have access to my kitchen here, so I might as well share with you guys some of the things that I find useful in navigating food. And so we're going to go through some of them right now. So what am I going to start with? I'm going to start with uh, salads. So um, sometimes as we're going through this discovery phase, I've heard that some clients basically go, well, I don't feel like I can have salads anymore because the salad dressings are too fatty. Totally get that thought process. And there is a hack for that. So what I mean by that is when I'm looking at salads, because I love having like a massive salad at the end of the day, I am obsessed with this salad dressing. It's called Brianna's Poppy Seed Dressing. It might be a little bit hard to see because of the glare, but Brianna's Poppy Seed Dressing. This is not a low fat dressing. I think I might be getting a text from Lisa that says something. Just a second, you guys. Oh, no video or audio yet. Let's see here. Might have to start again. All right, for those of you who are online right now, can you hear me? Chanley, can you hear me? <laughs> checking, checking, hi. Chanley, can you hear me? Oh, great, okay. So back to what we were talking about. Excellent. And hi, Londa. Nice to see you on. Excellent. Okay, so for Londa, um, this is our live Q&A, and we have these every week. And we basically go through questions. If you are going through and you have questions about anything at all, what you'll want to do is ask your questions in the ask a question bar here at the bottom. Uh, then what I can do is I can go through and I can timestamp them. So when people end up going through and watching this later, they can just click on the question. It'll fast forward directly to that question. So back to what I was talking about. Uh, we're, we're right into food hacks today. And so what I'm going through is salad dressing. So a lot of times when we're looking at incorporating salads and more vegetables into our day, uh, oh, there's so many things going on today. Uh, some people have a hard time feeling like they can have their favorite salad dressing and make it fit in a lower fat intake or macro range for that meal. So here's the hack. This is my favorite salad dressing and it's not low in fat. Uh, this one is two tablespoons, has 14 grams of fat, uh, seven grams of carbohydrate, zero protein. Uh, so it's not necessarily like a healthy option in terms of fat, although the, the ingredients are pretty darn good. So what I do is my hack is I take a tablespoon of this, which would then make it seven grams of fat, and then I blend it with balsamic vinegar. Balsamic vinegar has zero fat, five grams of carbohydrates for one tablespoon, and zero protein. So what this does is it allows me to have that taste of my favorite salad dressing just a little bit more watered down so that it'll toss in the, in the large salad that I have. So you can really do this with almost any salad dressing. Um, if it's an Asian style salad dressing, you could even use uh, rice vinegar or any other type of vinegar. Apple cider vinegar would be great. So that's just a little tip for you in terms of hacks for salads and keeping the fat intake low. Obviously, the additional toppings that you put on salads will make a big difference. So keeping things like cheese, nuts, avocado, bacon to a minimum if you're going to do this salad hack, because for most of us already that one tablespoon of that dressing would be enough. So that's the first hack. 
The second hack is that I have a massive sweet tooth and I've been trying to curb that lately. So I love donuts and I usually have those for pre-workout, but lately I've been on a chip craze and trying to remove sugar from my diet, even for my pre-workouts. So what I found are some pretty amazing chips out there. And the ones most recently I've found are plantain chips. Um, these are delicious and they're delicious. So this would be a great uh, play for a fat and carbohydrate based snack, maybe in the afternoon. Um, they are not low in calories overall, but they are freaking tasty. So this bag has five servings. It's not one of those bags that basically pretends that it has more in the bag than you would think. The bag is really filled like up to here. So it's a pretty good serving. So if you have five servings in the bag, kind of if you were going like here is essentially going to be one serving and they are some hearty chips. The ingredients are great. It's literally plantains, which is a, um, in the banana family. So it's a really great source of magnesium and starch and carbohydrates, um, coconut oil and Himalayan sea salt. Himalayan sea salt is a ton of sea salt that our body can actually readily use. So not all salt is created equal. Um, iodized salt is really devoid of a lot of the vitamins that we'll need. So Himalayan sea salt is one of the better sea salts. And on that salt topic, uh, I have a friend who is in the health industry and they have a company called Happy Healthy Guys. And they sent me two of their star products. Um, I didn't even know that salt was one of the things that they made, but I've never been so excited about salt in my life. And I don't mean to sound salesy here, but I like salt. Um, when I take put salt on my tongue, I'm like, oh, it's salty. Not the case with this one. So this is Red Ono Trace Mineral Rich Salt. So trace minerals are what we're really looking for when we're looking to add salt and sodium into our diets. This is called Red Ono. This is a pretty big bag and I almost wish it was in a shaker so that I didn't feel like I was just dousing everything with salt. Um, but what's amazing about this is that when I literally put it on my tongue, it dissolves like immediately and it doesn't spike this um, like saliva or anything in my, in my mouth. It just literally tastes amazing on its own and I've been adding it to everything and it it's an amazing ad um, so I believe that that with like vegetables and even putting it on avocado <laughs> so many things okay now Lisa's back she can hear everything this is great okay so the next thing um, in that same realm of the happy healthy guys they have something called SCT oil so maybe if you have ever been involved in the ketogenic craze or the bulletproof coffee, you might know something about MCT oil. So MCT is medium chain triglycerides. SCT oil, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank. Single chain triglycerides. So basically this stuff is essentially butter. It's a, it's a clarified form of butter and SET, so this type of oil is immediately usable for your body for energy. It helps to transport vitamins and minerals. It tastes freaking fantastic. It doesn't have a certain amount of things. It doesn't have casein. Um, casein as a form of animal products can be pretty hard for our body to process. Um, no lactose, no protein solids, um, which is something that can be added into uh, dairy or protein items. Um, it's hypoallergenic, gluten-free, sodium-free, non-GMO, and no trans fats. So this stuff, I found mixing this a little bit like a teaspoon, like a little goes a long way. Putting that in a pan with vegetables and the salt is all you need for veggies. It's delicious. Like, this stuff is crazy. Um, it is not cheap, though. Um, I feel fortunate that he sent this to me. Uh, but one container that's I think three times the size of this is like $70, which to me seems that's pretty crazy, but they must have done a lot of work to make that happen because I've been in the food industry before and generally speaking, the, the, the markup isn't high when it comes to food. So anyways, um, the next guy, I'm super excited about this. Oh, um, sorry. There's a question. So Lisa says, how much of it are you using to saute the veggies? Uh, I'm just sprinkling it on. 
not not a lot um it's it's pretty potent <laughs> um the the salt that it does have like the taste of the salt is um it's it's more salty not even more salty i don't know how to say it i don't use that much oh the sct oil um i lisa's asking how much do i use with the sct oil for sauteing veggies if i was sauteing like four cups probably a teaspoon um it's really uh flavorful so i think that would be just fine yeah okay the next thing and i'm super excited about this i know a lot of you have been on the cauliflower pizza craze but I found cauliflower sandwich thins, and they are delicious. Mm, they're so good. Uh, they have, for one of these sandwich thins, it is 50 calories, 2.5 grams of fat, two carbohydrates, and four grams of protein. What? <laughs> like, they're making like miracle food now. Um, the reason it has higher protein is it does have egg in it. It has Parmesan as well and nutritional yeast and cauliflower. That's it, four ingredients. Um, if I can find items in my diet that are six ingredients or less, I feel like I'm doing my body a great service. Um, when we start to get into like the 10, 15, 20, 50 ingredients, you'll start to notice there's a ton of preservatives in there that'll be really hard for your body to identify, process, and actually put to use. So these are a new fun one. Um, I've been putting Oh, I need to grab something out of the fridge. I've been putting cashew butter spread on these. Um, it's a like chive cashew butter and that's delicious as well. Uh, so you can easily just eat them plain on their own. Um, they've got a lot of protein in them, uh, but I'm finding it's just great as like making, feeling like I'm making a meal, like a big salad, like a little bit heartier. Um, I feel like you could also saute them and cut them in little bits and it could almost be like a crouton. So lots of fun things there. The last thing, uh, some of you know about these noodles, some of you may not. And these are, well, this, this package says skinny noodles, but basically these noodles are um, from a cognac root. Um, I believe it's a Japanese root. And basically they are noodles that are like ramen style, zero carbohydrates. Uh, one gram of fat, two grams of protein. Uh, there's like nothing in them, which seems kind of weird. <laughs> but it is, uh, let me see, the ingredients are purified water, cognac flour, there's some brown, brown rice flour in here as well, pumpkin powder and calcium hydroxide. Uh, they, they are delicious. Um, they don't taste like much on their own, which is nice because then whatever you add to them, will just increase the flavor. Uh, so they'll absorb the flavor of whatever sauce or oil or anything that you're putting into those noodles. What I like to do is I like to take those noodles, I put a little bit of sesame oil, some chicken and some vegetables, and they are filling. The only thing that I would say about these is that some people with this type of root uh, it has a lot of starch in it, I think, by the property itself. So some people find that it's very filling. I feel like they expand quite a bit in your stomach. And just something to be considerate of. Uh, some people don't find, like, for example, Jeff, my partner, doesn't like them. They don't sit well in his stomach. For me, they're totally fine. I freaking love them. I can eat them all day. Uh, but for him, they don't sit well. So I would just listen to your body in that sense see what feels best for you, and then just have a little bit of awareness around your meals and seeing what food items actually feel good for you. Okay, so that is our little uh, food hack portion. Uh, that's something new that I just wanted to do today because I have the kitchen access. And so now we'll go right into questions. So again, if this is your first time either watching this live or watching this later, if you do have questions, you can ask these questions either in the weekly feedback forms, the Awaken Your uh, Nutrition Code feedback form. There's a portion there at the bottom where it's like, what questions do you have for this week's Q&A? Or if you're watching this live, you can always put your questions either into the chat and Lisa will transfer it over or save her a second <laughs> and just ask your questions right away in the ask a question section in the bottom bar. And then I will go through and timestamp it as we get through them. So without further ado, let's get right into the first question. So this one is from Gisu. 
So she says, are my macronutrients range, are my macronutrient ranges working as expected? Could you check my macronutrient ranges food diary to see if I am on target? My fitness pal username, uh, I almost always use the workout day calorie macro ranges. It's doable for the most part, except on the one day a week that I take a rumble boxing class, boxing, strength training, hit floor work. Should that day be workout day calories or macros as well? That would be seven days a week of the higher ranges. Okay, excellent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go right into Gisu's log. So you guys can always do this. You can always ask questions and ask us to check your logs out. So I am going to check it out. So what I'm understanding with Gisu is that I believe she has another question in here that comes later that she's getting pretty hungry. So Gisu, I've actually already adjusted your macro ranges. I gave you a bump for your training days to 1400 calories. And I would say this is only applicable if you feel already like the calorie ranges are working for you and like you are seeing the progress that you want to see. Um, if you're feeling really, really hungry on the days, especially after this training day, we want to make sure that you're fueling your body appropriately. And it sounds like this workout is definitely more intense. Um, I've done things like Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu in the past, and my body was so hungry. It's very taxing. So not all workouts will be the same. Some will absolutely require more fuel than others, um, more rest as well. But also what you're saying is that it sounds like you're working out every day a week, like seven days a week. I'm not sure if I have this right. And if that's the case, I would really emphasize taking some rest days in there. Um, rest is just as important as training. And if you're doing int intense training sessions like this, and I know you do a little bit of aerial as well, if you're doing intense training sessions and you're not giving yourself the opportunity to rest, you will not be able to build muscle tissue effectively. So rest is equally as important as the training aspect itself. And of course, the type of fuel that we're getting. Uh, more often, or what, from what I'm seeing in your logs, your food items look great. Your balance is looking really good as well. Um, it looks like we have a day Wednesday that is just a little bit over an intake. But the rest of the days look really good. So maybe that was your recovery day. Uh, so what I would say is check out your macronutrient ranges because I increased the ranges for your training days um, just slightly. That works as long as you have you feel like you're progressing in the right in the right areas. Um, if you are not, go ahead and just catch us up on the Facebook group so that we can kind of ask more questions and dive a little bit deeper into what might need to be changed. Hope that helps. All right, here we go. So this is another one from Gisu. It might be the same kind of thread. So she says, I did a 45 minute rumble class on Tuesday and I had my protein shake, a full dinner and a half serving of oatmeal saved in my macros. But I was still starving after all of that and had no calories left. What should I do? Okay, I'm gonna go right in and check on your Tuesday. So the immediate thing that I'm seeing is that you decided to skip carbs first thing in the morning. So your morning doesn't have any complex carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates are really kind of setting the stage if we have them first thing in the morning. So we've been fasting for like eight to 10 hours or so at night. And so making sure that your breakfast actually is one of those meals that does have complex carbs along with a little bit of fat and protein. Um, like realistically, having breakfast as the biggest meal of the day can be so beneficial for a number of reasons. But the first one is that the first intake is basically you setting up your body for uh, stable blood sugar levels. So you're basically giving your body the first piece of information for the rest of the day. So if you have complex carbohydrates, lean protein, moderate amount of fat, you're giving your body everything that it needs to just hit the ground running. Uh, if we don't have all of those things, what you might find, it's like if you don't have that complex carb to start up the day, you might find that energy levels basically drop uh, more, more quickly and that you actually find yourself more hungry later because there'll be an, a sugar level imbalance. So you might try, especially on the heavier days, to place a complex carb in your breakfast, 
maybe skip it or make it a little bit lighter at lunch and then make sure that you have a complex carb heavy dinner. Uh, and also, since we did up your uh, your intake um, for the training days, you might find that that kind of subsides with the change in macronutrient ranges. Uh, additionally, if you feel like your macronutrient ranges so far on other days have worked, maybe you just need a bump of calories on those days. So maybe you add 100 to 150 calories on that rumble boxing class day and then just spread the intake evenly throughout the day um, and see how that works for you. Because not all days are created equal, right? Some exercises and activities that we have will require more energy. So this is when you get to listen to your body and kind of go, okay, my body's still hungry. It's probably for a reason. Uh, and so if you're really feeling that true hunger, then we can play around and you can increase your calories for that day and just see how you feel. That's what I would recommend. All right. Oh, we got, oh, we got lots from Gisu. Okay, here we go. So another one from Gisu. Shannon mentioned last week that people can have better results when they remove certain processed foods from their diets for the extent possible. Her example was Dave's killer bread. I ordered Ezekiel cinnamon raisin bread, which seems more natural. Does that one seem okay? Okay, I'm gonna look at it. If it's in here. Okay, I don't see it in here necessarily just yet, and maybe you haven't received it yet, but I will answer that question. So when it comes to processed foods, and this ties into a topic that Lisa and I have been talking about, um, on my way back from Vietnam, I watched a show called What, what the Health. It was a documentary on Netflix. And definitely something to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, a lot of the information can be taken out of context. And then even me, <laughs> I'll be like, oh, my God, I'm never eating meat again. But that doesn't need to happen. So uh, when we look at processed food items, it's the same thing around okay so when we look at uh processed food it basically means depending on the extent of processing that it's either been fortified meaning that vitamins and minerals have been stripped out of that food item and then added back in in the form of preservatives or chemically produced vitamins and minerals that have been fortified and it's funny because when I actually thought of fortification before, I thought it was almost enhancing something, like making it better. But it's pretty hard to enhance nature, um, especially when it just comes naturally. So when we look at processed foods, uh, definitely some of the items like bread. Bread on its own has very few ingredients. And so actually getting fresh baked bread will be the, the <laughs> some of the best stuff that you can get. So... I think our previous connotation and understanding of health um, told us that bread was bad, like fresh baked bread, baked bread, baked bread, <laughs> and all of these things were not as healthy. And I'm not sure where we got that idea. But marketing is so tricky right now. So Dave's Killer Bread, for example, um, has great marketing. Oh, it's high protein and it's lower calories and all of these like key words. But when you look at the ingredients, there's like 50 ingredients for bread. Why? It doesn't need to be that way. Bread on its own is just as delicious, delicious as if even not more so. So um, the Ezekiel bread, I think, will be a really great option. Um, if it's the frozen one, I think that that's great. Sprouted grain is excellent because it's uh, the proteins of the actual gluten or the actual wheat is still intact. And that can be stripped when it's not sprouted. So it's easier for your body to absorb the nutrients from. Uh, also, on the same processed food topic, the main thing or one of the biggest things with processed food is when it comes to meat and dairy products. So meat and dairy products that have been cured, like deli meats, um, or processed like sausages, uh, anything that has preservatives, all of these items, they not only have preservatives, but they also have added hormones. Um, they sometimes are injected with sodium uh, solutions just to preserve them longer. It's just plain weird, and our body is not like that. So I would definitely stay away from sausage, period. Uh, I would take a look at some of the cured meats, even the deli meats that are sliced that are right from the deli. Uh, they've still been um, 
they still have things added to them to make them hold longer for their shelf life. So if you can actually really stick to buying organic whenever possible, local whenever possible, and cook it from its raw form, that will be the best case scenario whenever you can. When it comes to dairy, uh, organic is always best. Um, some people do really well with sheep or goat milk, but realistically, our bodies aren't designed to drink milk from a different species that was meant to grow baby animals. As adults, we don't need that. Uh, yeah, okay, rant on that one over. So here we go. Uh, next one. Oh, this is a good one. They're all good. Uh, the fuck it mentality is still coming up frequently. How do I change my mindset from approaching this program as a diet to more of a lifestyle? When I go over my macros, I feel like I've blown it and I want the binge. I want to binge the rest of the day. How do we change our perspective of viewing foods and ways of eating as good versus bad? How would the inner dialogue course help with this? Really, really good question. Okay, so uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me here is you as an individual. So when we look at our connotations of good versus bad, I like to break it down. So when we're looking at uh, good versus bad in terms of food, breaking it down in terms of where does that come from? So you have a belief about something that's good or bad. Where did it come from? Where did that start? Did it start with family? Did it start with something you read in a magazine? Uh, do you even remember where it came from? I would almost say that that is step one. Step one of understanding what good versus bad looks like and what it pertains to and where it started. If you don't know where it started, that's fine because then you can actually give yourself the opportunity to go, okay, maybe I don't know where that came from. I just have this thought in my head that it's good or bad. So now I can look at it with more awareness and go, okay, is it good or bad? Can I educate myself on whether that's actually the truth or not? Uh, so that is one aspect of it. The next aspect goes into uh, the fuck it mentality and feeling like you've blown it. So when we look at that, immediately what comes to mind is expectation. So we have a, or we can put a certain expectation on ourselves to do something quote unquote perfectly, but there really isn't a perfect. Uh, there is only a perfect for you. And that perfect for you has really come from a line that you might have drawn in the sand of what you expect of yourself. So if you have an experience with a diet from the past, that means that you have to be restrictive. Well, then that's where your perfect line might fall. So if you don't fall into that perfection, uh, then you feel like you've fucked it up. And so now it's all over. Now you're now you're starting at square one and then it's that kind of mentality. If you are coming from the context that perfect is simply a discovery of what works for you and what doesn't, both in terms of how you feel, uh, the progress that you're seeing, and also how you're taking care of your body, it can be a different experience. So I'm not really sure where I personally came to this realization. I think it was when I started to play around with macronutrients in moderation, when I really started to like plan a donut into my day and make it work for me in terms of energy levels. Uh, if I planned it ahead of time, it gave me the power to make that choice um, that was my own. It wasn't anyone else telling me, yes, you should do that or you shouldn't do that. It was something that I got to choose for myself. I had the accountability. It wasn't being thrown at me that I should be doing this or I should be doing that. It was me giving myself the opportunity to try it out and see how it felt in my body. So that's one aspect of it. Um, when it comes to the inner dialogue course, what we do in that course is we basically give you the space and the activities to start to really understand where those beliefs and mindsets come from of good or bad, uh, cultural influence, family influence, your environment, uh, how you actually experience having a meal. Uh, so many of us just go through having meals and we're just scarfing food down or we're looking at our phones, we're watching TV, and not that any of that has to go away. <laughs> 
if you don't want it to, but there's a lot of insight that's available in how we actually go through having meals. Um, if we enjoy them, if we know where food's coming from, um, how we're feeling, like having insight into how our body actually feels when we're eating that food, um, if we like it or not. Most of the time I'm eating food and I don't even understand, I'm not even present enough to understand how, what it tastes like. That's how busy I am, I'm just scarfing food down. But when I've done these activities, I've actually had a moment and more of awareness to go, okay, wow, uh, yeah, I still like that food, that one particular food. And then another food, I'd be like, why have I been eating this for so long? Like, I don't like that. Like, no. <laughs> so the Inner Dialogue course gives space for a lot of realizations throughout the four weeks. And then it's also opening up more of the topics of, you know, the relationship to food in terms of social environments, um, how that really comes into play. When we choose different things in our life, how that impacts not only our opinions of self, but how we feel like other people might perceive us. That's a big one. Uh, so it's it's a really big topic and I, and I wanna talk to you about it more, Carolyn. So I'd love to hear more of your thoughts um, in the Facebook group, because I think this was from one of your questions. Okay, that was a big rant. There's so many places to go with that. Uh, next one here. So how many times a week can one theoretically dine out and still lose weight? How often do you, Shannon, dine out while in maintenance mode? It's a tricky question. So realistically, when I am here at home, I don't have a lot of time to eat out. <laughs> um, but when I'm maintaining, uh, I will probably eat out maximum of once a week. And realistically, when I do that once a week, I don't necessarily like it uh, because I'm not in control of what I'm getting. When I'm in maintenance, however, that's totally different. So when I'm in maintenance, um, generally I'll have two nights eating out a week. It'll be like a Tuesday with a girlfriend and then Friday we'll usually order pizza. Uh, this works for my body. The rest of the meals I am weighing, I am tracking and they're pretty darn consistent from day to day. Uh, the only thing that changes is on the weekend maybe there will be a treat or like something that's out of the normal, uh, like a scone or something that's thrown in there as a pre-workout. Uh, but even on the weekends, I'm eating pretty consistent um, because it feels good in my body. I found the things that I like. I found what works for me. And if anything, I just throw in new items like these plantain chips or the cauliflower thins to kind of change things up. But I like to try new recipes on the weekends because I have time to do that. And then I'll try to implement that into the next week's meals. Um, but when we're looking at dropping, I think the more frequently you can really be in control of what you're getting, the more information you're going to have for your body in terms of what works and what doesn't. I know that's not realistic for everyone. So if you are in a job where you have catered lunches and you're trying to make those lunches work for you, I would take the opportunity to bring a scale to work one day weigh out the things that you think that you're going to be having regularly or that are going to be available regularly and then put those into the app create a meal for that and then uh, make that kind of your go-to um, if you have dinners out quite frequently i would start to build a repertoire of the restaurants that you feel like you can navigate more easily and that have the least amount of sauces um, additives you know have cleaner options that you can work with um, vegetable sides, salads that are pretty clean, or you can at least modify to your liking and then really good lean protein options. But realistically, I would say two times a week for restaurants is pretty doable um, in terms of loss or like staying on track and maintenance. Uh, let me see here, we have someone else. Oh, hey, Carolyn. We're just getting into some of your questions, I think. Nice to see you. All right. So done with that guy. Okay, what do you know? Here's one of your questions. So when do we adjust our macros based on the weight we are losing? Do we wait until the plateau in weight loss or does this tend to take a certain number of weeks based on each individual? If we don't wanna wait for the plateau, is there a more safe way to do a gradual cut after the first few weeks of the same macros? 
I understand that this option might be riskier in terms of sustainability. Okay, I'm just gonna kind of skin this again. Just our macros based on the weight we are losing. Okay, so when we look at weight loss in terms of macronutrients, sustainable weight loss for um, someone like a female, you and I have a fairly similar size, so I'm just gonna say like us, uh, that you'll be looking for 0.5 to one pound fat loss per week. When we have more than that, it's generally a loss of muscle tissue and water combined. So when we have a much more drastic weight loss, we're usually dipping into muscle stores now. Um, it really takes a lot of energy for our body to metabolize one pound of fat. One pound of fat is similar to if you were to look at a pound of butter and how much energy it would require for you to clean a pound of butter off of maybe like all of your dishes. Like it's sticky, um, it takes a lot of elbow grease and soap to get that out. So metabolizing fat in our body really does require quite a lot of work. So sticking with the 0.5 to one pound of fat loss per week is really a, a pretty solid goal, not only for sustainability, but also so we're not dipping into using stored uh, muscle or using muscle mass and breaking that down and then converting that into energy because that's what ultimately happens when we go too far into a caloric deficit. Also, when we go too far in, into a caloric deficit, what you'll find is either you will start to reduce your basal metabolic rate, so the rate that you're burning calories while resting because if we eat too little, we start to break down muscle tissue and then therefore our metabolism starts to decrease then what happens is that when we start to eat quote unquote normal or a higher calorie range again, our body is not as efficient at metabolizing fat because our metabolism has dropped. And so we will then start to add fat or gain fat more easily when we start to eat to our, you know, previous ranges or higher ranges. And then we have that yo-yo dieting thing coming in. So when we drastically reduce calories and then go back to eating what we were before, it doesn't really work because now our body's less efficient at burning um, energy. On the other side of the coin, if you now switch the focus to building muscle and your training is focused to building muscle and you start to increase your calories, not only will your body actually be better at building muscle, but it will also um, reduce body fat as well at the same time, if you're doing this in a balanced fashion. So what I mean by this is that if you're giving your body enough energy and nutrition to actually build muscle tissue, your body will start to increase its metabolism, therefore being more efficient at burning fat while resting. This one took a while for me to wrap my head around, um, and I didn't really truly understand it until I started to apply it. But in that sequence, I basically got my body down to a weight and a leanness that I felt like I wanted, but I also found that my muscle mass decreased a lot when I was cutting. So then I shifted my focus to building muscle mass, and when I did that, I increased calories slowly. And as I did that, I found that I was building muscle and I was losing fat at the same time. So it's a pretty interesting scenario. But to kind of go back to the beginning of your question, um, in terms of weight loss, I think it's too early um, for this question for you because we're still finding your happy medium. Um, like where you are comfortable with incorporating a lifestyle with nutrition into the mix. So we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves in terms of the plateau and weight loss. Um, we generally won't have, oh, hold on, we have a question. So would you recommend waiting about four weeks or so before adjusting macros or maybe longer? Uh, generally speaking, if we see a plateau and we have all of the consistency throughout a couple of weeks, so macros are being hit appropriately, um, water intake is great, uh, workouts are pretty consistent, and we're not seeing a change then, every two weeks, that's when I would start to make adjustments. Only if we have consistency, um, things are really dialed in, it's clean eating, all of that kind of stuff. Thank you for clarifying that, Lisa. <laughs> okay, next one. 
if we get a DEXA scan of our body fat percentage muscle mass, can our macros be more accurately adjusted? Absolutely. Yes. And Caroline, uh, we have an in body body composition scan right up the street from the circus center. So you could come and do a scan with us and, uh, we can link in the, the scheduling for that as well. And then you and I can spend like 30 minutes together and it's cheaper than the DEXA. Just a thought. Okay. Last one here. Do hormones like cortisol and insulin and any others affect our weight loss, even if we are maintaining a caloric deficit? If so, how? Yes, absolutely. So cortisol is a stress hormone and it's released in a lot of different times. And I'm not like a super master when it comes to cortisol, but I do know a little bit. So I'll share with you what I do know. So we release cortisol in various times. Um, when we are stressed, we will release cortisol when there's any sort of emotional trauma or um, emotional upset going on in our lives. We will generally release cortisol when we're not sleeping enough and when we're overtraining. We actually release cortisol when we are working out and doing any sort of intense bouts of exercise, but getting protein intake actually helps to um, counterbalance that. So cortisol is actually um, catabolic. So it will start to break down our muscle tissue when it's released in excess and we don't have a natural kind of like barrier or protection against it. In terms of insulin, insulin resistance especially can absolutely affect weight loss. So insulin resistance uh, can really show up in our body in the form of holding stubborn body fat, especially around our midsection. So when we have insulin resistance, it's usually due to a few primary factors. Uh, the first one can be hormones and thyroid issues. Um, that's, that's definitely something that can come into play. So unless you've had any sort of testing done for thyroid um, or hormonal imbalances, and you know that that's not part of the equation, then we can just throw that one off. Um, if you have a feeling that maybe that might be something that you're experiencing, um, adrenal fatigue, any sort of hormonal issues, uh, then I would get tested to make sure. Uh, second portion is if we do have insulin resistance, it can be caused by a couple of things in terms of diet. An excess of sugar or carbohydrate or alcohol consumption at a time, which means that basically we get too much glycogen and it overflows our three glycogen storage buckets. So we have that muscle, liver, and bloodstream storage containers. So if we have really big meals or those meals where we basically want to say fuck it, uh, it will overflow and basically cause an excess that will uh, cause an insulin spike, but will have more energy in the form of sugar release at a time. So our body will not be able to put it to use when it can't put it to use. Basically, insulin is like he's the door guy to our cells. He basically goes, yo, <laughs> our nightclub of energy is full, so I can't use that. So you guys can't come in. Um, and when they can't come in, that sugar or energy that's trying to get into the cells, they basically go into fat storage. Um, that is one thing that will happen. The other thing which I feel like is more consistent is when we have higher fat intake. So the nature of high fat intake, especially if it's coming from dairy and meat products, is that the nature of excess fat of this kind will actually bind to the receptor sites of our cells, it'll bind to the receptor sites of insulin. So again, just kind of like an overview on insulin. Insulin is the door guy to our cells. Um, it opens the door to receive energy in the form of glucose into our cells. When we have too much fat in the diet, basically the fat binds to the doorway, um, basically binds to insulin and prevents insulin from opening the door so that we can receive uh, glucose or glycogen for energy. When we have high fat intake like this, like let's say that your ranges are around like 30 to 40 a day, for example, some of you will be higher. Uh, if you have like, let's say a day where it's 60 or 70, if your body can't metabolize that fat, it will basically bind to the receptor sites of insulin and stay for up to 60 hours afterwards. So that will cause an insulin resistance. And if that's the case, then it will basically bounce any other carbohydrate that's trying to get into the cells for up to three days after. 
it'll bounce it back and it'll go into fat storage or it has the potential to go into fat storage. So keeping fat intake in moderation, especially at one meal and especially coming from dairy and meat products is going to be pretty darn important. Um, yeah. Does that kind of answer that question for you, Caroline? Let me know. We have a little delay here, so I may not be able to, um, or I may not see the answer right away. And you may, may not be able to answer me because you might be working. But let me know if that answers your question. Um, Chanley and Lisa, did I miss anything? Nope. Oh, okay. Well, fun. Um, another little piece here. Oh, did we just lose her? Ah, she just dropped out. Okay, well, anyways. Another thing here is I'm gonna give you an update. So um, just in terms of travel and the way our body retains weight, et cetera, generally speaking, when we have travel days, we will definitely retain a lot of weight. Um, when I got off the plane after traveling from Vietnam, I felt the swelling in my body everywhere, especially like legs, ankles, midsection. And I actually, so I got home when I was 124. Um, when I left, I was 121. Um, yesterday I was 124 again. And I was like, what the fuck? And then today I was 121. <laughs> so I guess for my body, it took five days this time. So just giving you guys an update. Um, I think that will be it for this section right now. Unless, Carolyn, if you have any more questions, let me know. Or if you feel like you want to touch in on any of the topics that we've already covered, give me a shout. And if not, um, we will close today's Q&A session. So let me know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take the silence as you have what you need. And again, if you have any more questions. Oh, yeah, Lisa just posted the Calendly link for the in-body scan. So you can just, uh, you can schedule an in-body scan and then we can chat more about all the things. Um, we're literally like right above, uh, we're three blocks away from the circus center. Oh, okay, one more. Okay, hi from Caroline. I tend to head right to the stacks at social events because I don't usually love socializing. Even with a plan, I tend to overdo it. Okay, all right. So in this sense, let's see here. So a couple things come to mind, but you might have to clue me in a little bit more and you can just roll through um, giving me your thoughts in the comments. So when I think about going to social events and not liking to socialize and just like going to snacking as almost a form of self-soothing or like keeping yourself busy, I would almost separate these two. So I might actually eat before you get there as one thing and then choose to maybe do something else. Well, also like if you don't like socializing, then why are you there? It's a question. I'm not super big into certain types of socializing either. So I've definitely started to build my muscle of just saying no to the things that don't serve me completely and that I'm not really interested in. And yes to the things that really drive my passion and make me feel amazing. So, hmm. so maybe, maybe let's look at this aspect. Like, if you're going into socializing and snacking, is this at work? Is this at um, some sort of event uh, that happens regularly? Like, where does this kind of scenario come into play? And if you're in a place where we can do this, I can bring you on screen. Let me know. Um, let me see. Another part, as I'm waiting for this delay, is... Yeah, so definitely planning to eat even before you go so that you've already had like a balanced meal and you're not using that social, you know, 
choices in terms of food for uh, trying to balance out your macros because that probably won't work very well. Um, you can eat like a lighter meal and then just have the snacks that you feel like you want. But if you personally feel like you are going through kind of a transformation in changing your relationship to food and how frequently you go through and having like that fuck it mentality if you're going through snacking and just wanting to have all the things and as much of it as you feel like you need or want during that time, you might try eating first and then not even giving yourself the option to snack when you're there. Just bringing a water or a tea or a coffee or whatever else that you might want to keep that experience happening of consuming something because that is a real experience um, of having something to feel like you're not only partaking in like the consumption of something or the enjoyment of like a, a beverage or a food item, but you're not necessarily having to snack the whole time. Does any of this stuff help? The other aspect, oh, um, Lisa's chiming in here. Um, Lisa says, so I used to do this too, but with alcohol, drinking out shyness or nervous energy. This is a big topic. It is a big topic, really big. Um, Lisa, do you want to come on? <laughs> I know I didn't prepare you for this. We've got like 10 minutes. Lisa or Caroline. Or Chandler. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a really big topic in terms of alcohol and um, using food as almost like a protective mechanism. Yeah, there's a lot of different threads in here. <laughs> Lisa says, oh, I'm so not camera ready. No problem. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of finish on the thought of this topic, but maybe Lisa, we plan to talk about this next week. Um, Chanley says, I've got a longer question about stress response, cortisol, and shift work, but I'll save that for next time. Okay, that would be awesome. Yeah, and if you can post it ahead of time, that would be great, because then if I need to do research, I can. Yes, that's that's great. Um, okay, I'm going to stop this one real quick. Um, I really appreciate that you posted that question in the question portion. Chanley says, you'll get an example after I log my first day of work meals in MyFitnessPal. Okay, cool. Looking forward to it. Um, the other aspect in terms of socializing, and this is a really big one, and it's a super easy trick. Uh, so this goes really for any time that we're eating around other people and we feel like we have a goal that is for ourselves. So a couple strategies to make it much easier. The first one is to know, to really know that if you are concerned about other people and what they think about you and what you're eating, they don't, they don't really care. Uh, they don't really care what you're drinking. They don't really care what you're eating. Um, they're more focused on their own stuff than what you're doing. Um, and I think this is a natural human reaction that not only are we conscious of how we're being perceived, but then if we are conscious about that, then we tend to like put judgments on other people. Um, but really those judgments traditionally stem from our own insecurities. So what I mean by this for an example is, let's say you're going out with friends and I'll use alcohol because it's a really easy way to do it. Uh, you're going out with friends and it's someone's birthday and they go, okay, shots for everyone. And you're like, oh, no, no, thanks. No, none for me. And the person's birthday, they're like, what? You're not drinking? Like, what a loser. <laughs> and they might say something like that. 10 times out of 10, and I really mean this, the person that says, oh, what a loser has a problem with alcohol. They have a problem themselves and they are projecting that block that they are experiencing onto you. It has nothing to do with you. So that is one aspect of it. The other aspect is, or, or the other tool to use is to first know that generally speaking, people are so concerned about what they're doing, they're not really too concerned about what you're doing. And if they do have any sort of communication about like, oh, I can't believe you're doing that, or why would you eat that, or why, are you, why aren't you drinking? It's generally a projection of 
issues that they haven't dealt with in themselves and they're projecting it onto you. Uh, the next thing is that if you want to set yourself up for success in social scenarios and you know people there, if it's family, if it's friends, and you're going into that scenario, give them a heads up ahead of time of what you are working to do for yourself. So what that looks like is like, let's say I'm going out to dinner with a girlfriend or I'm going to have dinner with family and I really have goals that I'm shooting for. I will tell them ahead of time, hey, I'm only having a glass of wine tonight. I'm just letting you know so that you can keep me honest and I can stay on track with my goals. Like I want your help. If you can imagine being asked for help in that way, I bet that you would be like, yeah, totally. I'll help you. Yeah, I'm going to keep you honest. Yeah, you only get one drink. That's all you get. <laughs> and I would keep them um, accountable. Uh, when it comes to family, if you're going to a family dinner, just giving them a heads up and going like, hey, um, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to do for myself, for my health. I have these goals. Um, if we're having a dinner, I would really like to incorporate these kinds of food items. If you want me to pick something up and bring it and I can kind of navigate how to make things work for me so you don't have to do extra work, I'm totally happy to do that. Or maybe we can make a family meal and maybe it can be a little bit more balanced and we can all try it out to be something new. So giving them a heads up for what you're doing, because I know a lot of moms out there and grandmas uh, really want to almost like give you all the food. And if you don't eat it, especially with older generations, it almost feels like an insult. So we, we don't want to do that. I know most of us don't want to feel like we're insulting anyone by not eating what they've made us. So if we give them a heads up, it basically kills two birds with one stone. It helps them to now make something for us that we will actually want to eat and enjoy. And then we can stay in our goals. And then it might give them an opportunity to find new strategies for healthy cooking. So I think that is going to be it for time. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys this when you do get a chance to watch it. Uh, and again, keep posting your questions in. We have a really good banter going in the community right now. So we want to see, see that flowing. And happy Friday. And thanks, Lisa and Chanley, for being on. And Carolyn and Londa, I saw you peek in there for a second. So I hope you guys have a great day. And we'll see you in the Facebook group.